And I'll just give it another minute or so to let a couple of other participants join. All right. So hello, everybody. I'm Athrea Mothur, the Director of Legal Research at the Center for Art Law, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our Art Law Colloquium on how NFTs revolutionize art, business, and entertainment with Edward Lee. And before I introduce our wonderful speaker for today, and as per usual, let me let you know a little bit about the Center for Art Law and what we do. We are a Brooklyn-based research and education nonprofit, and we're dedicated to offering resources and programming to advance the arts and law community. Through our website, our newsletter, our events, we disseminate information and we try to keep our audience updated on everything art law, whether it's programs, cases, publications, movies. If it's art and law, we try to cover it all. And we also facilitate tons of conversations by hosting and participating in programs such as ours today. And of course, this doesn't even begin to cover everything that we do. So I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter already if you haven't to receive updates. I would also invite you to become a premium member at the center to receive tons of offers, discounts for upcoming events, to have access to our case law corner, our articles, and the recordings of our past events. I'm also really excited to announce some of the upcoming events that we do have. We have a webinar on DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations and the Art Market. We also have our legal clinics this month. We have our Artist Dealer Relationships Clinic um, mid mid-May, and we have our legacy and estate planning clinic in June. And during these clinics, we pair our artists with our network of volunteer attorneys and professionals for one-on-one -on -one consultations in contracts and consignment agreements and on legacy and estate planning. These are all up on our website, so please take a look and I hope to see you at all of them. A few of the general housekeeping matters for today. The program is being recorded for archival purposes, but as I mentioned, we would love to see you. So please feel free to keep your cameras on, but your microphone's muted for the moment. And once the video is available, I will send across a recording of the session, the handout and materials for the day, and a survey for the event as well. And if you have any questions for our wonderful speaker, we will be having a question and answer session. So you can put them in the chat box below. I would invite you to send in your questions. We really appreciate interactive sessions. And now finally coming to our webinar for today, we have Professor Edward Lee, who is a leading legal expert on NFTs and intellectual property. He is a professor of law and co-director of the Illinois Tech Chicago Kent College of Law's Center for Design, Law and Technology. He has a website, now NFT, which analyzes the latest developments in NFTs. He founded the Free Internet Project, a not-for-profit whose mission is to protect internet freedoms. He's a former contributor to the Huffington Post. His work has been featured in outlets such as the Washington Post, Billboard, and so, so many things. But I will let you read his full bio and the handout for today, which will be sent across shortly. But for now, and without any further ado, I will hand it over to you, Edward. Thank you so, so much once again for being here. And we're really excited to, to hear about you, your journey, your book, and, um, and everything in between. Thank you so much, uh, Treya, for that introduction. Uh, here is, I don't know if you can see it here. Uh, I need to move it back. It's the, it's the wonders of Zoom. I think I need to hide. Well, I'll show it to you at the end uh, on the slides. I plan on speaking for uh, about 40 minutes about my book, Creators Take Control, and then uh, hopefully uh, field your questions about it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, now. And thank you all for attending in your busy schedules. I really uh, appreciate it. 
Now, to start out uh, today's talk, I thought it would be helpful to actually uh, start out with history, with the turn of the 20th century, when there was a threat, or at least a perceived threat, that the New York Times editorial described in 1913 in the following way. This movement is surely a part of the general movement discernible all over the world to disrupt and degrade, if not destroy, not only art, but society. Now, what was this threat to society that the New York Times referred to? It was not AI, rest assured. Uh, we can have that discussion later. But it was actually art. It was a new approach to art. This threat was so serious that the students of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right down the street from me on Michigan Avenue, organized a mass protest and put on a mock trial an artist that was using this uh, new approach, charging that artist with artistic murder. And a jury at this protest convicted the artist as charged and rendered a sentence of death. Now, this may seem like a laughing matter, but it was not. And you may be asking yourself, well, who was this artist? This artist was Matisse, who was one of the modern artists that were singled out as being potentially uh, spreading this de degenerate form of art. Now, the leading physicians in the United States, including Dr. Francis Durkham, who has a disease named after him for what he diagnosed, he was a top neurologist, uh, described this and provided the imprimatur of medicine to weigh in on this controversy. I will say that the drawings of insane artists are far superior to the alleged works of art I saw at the exhibition. This was reported by the Washington Times, which also included and quoted from other leading American physicians, describing this as medical sciences protest against the new art in quotations, skeptical that this was actually an art, calling this the freak fad of modern painting. The Times went on to suggest that we should consider quarantining these artists and even, this is you know, great for all the lawyers in the audience, even amending the Constitution to get rid of or limit the freedom of speech. Now, the Times quoted from an, an anonymous pamphlet that attacked this new approach to art characterizing it as the product of a modernistic degenerate cult involving worshipers of Satan and the God of ugliness. Yeah, this would sort of put to shame the conspiracy theories of today. Like this was considered to be this big conspiracy related to modern art. The New York Times even called these artists freaks, which was a term that was commonly used to refer to these artists. Now, today in the 21st century, you may be asking yourself, what was so disturbing back then about the modern artists? What was so disturbing? Well, the initial instigator of all of this backlash was a new approach to art called Cubism. And what Cubism did was effectuate a radical shift in perspective. The shift in perspective went from what we would characterize as a single linear perspective. And it became something that was multiple perspectives embodied in what are likened to being cubes. And this was actually in a, a disparagement, a criticism by an art critic in France that derided these paintings as consisting of bizarre cubes. So that label stuck with cubism. So the shift went something from the Renaissance, the Last Supper, with this single linear perspective, what you might find as a result of a photograph, to now we're going to shift to cubism, where we're going to now embody something in fragments or cubes. And here is Picasso's famous girl with the mandolin. And this approach basically obliterated artistic conventions, threw it out the window, even beyond cubism, right? The, the cubism approach of Picasso was relatively a short few years, 
And then Picasso went on to do other things as well as other artists went on to do other things. It, to borrow a sort of phrase from the Matrix movie, it enabled artists to free your mind. You didn't have to follow a convention to be successful as an artist. Okay. Now, back then, this was considered to be radically disruptive, as we can tell from the student protests from the, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And this produced, this may be surprising to some of you who are not familiar with this history, this produced decades of backlash, especially in the United States. Some countries were more receptive to it, such as France. But in the United States, as you can tell from the initial opening of this talk, there was hostility, outright hostility, because people thought it would lead to degeneracy in the United States. Now, unfortunately or tragically, this view was not contained just to the United States. The view that this art would lead to degeneracy was picked up in Nazi Germany. And the Nazi uh, German government confiscated tens of thousands of modern art works and classified them as degenerate art, sold them to fund World War II, their effort in World War II. Now, we know in the 21st century how that episode turned out and how modern art became widely accepted as the most influential movement in the 20th, 20th century for art. And Cubism, what it did, ultimately prevailed, but tragically it came at a tra uh, serious cost given the uh, eventual use of the degenerate art label by Nazi Germany. Today, we also consider Cubism to be one of the most influential art movements of the 20th century for good reason. And the co-founder of Cubism, Pablo Picasso, we consider to be one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, if not in history. And I think rightfully so as well. Now, this brief page of history, I think, puts us in a much better position to understand the radical transformations occurring in the 21st century. We also have a threat, a perceived threat at least, that has been characterized by the media, and these are direct quotations, as a giant Ponzi scheme, a scam, a grift, a cult, ugly, hideous, a crime against humanity. Now, what is this threat to society in the 21st century? It's something called an NFT which I'm guessing many of you are at least somewhat familiar with, uh, a non-fungible token. Now, this in actuality is just a computer program that is stored on blockchain and it creates a virtual ownership of some subject matter and the most prominent subject matter so far has been digital artworks. And I'll, I'll get into that in a few minutes. There haven't been mass protests yet of NFTs, but at the 2022 NFT NYC conference, right there for those of you in New York, there was a mock protest uh, organized by artist Bobby Hundreds. And yes, God does hate NFTs that was playing off the media backlash to NFTs. Now, why has there been such hostility and backlash to NFTs especially in the boom days of 2021? Well, I believe it's because there has been a radical shift in ownership, and that's the key innovation that NFTs provided. Ownership through virtual tokens stored on blockchain. Now, they aren't actually tokens. They're just virtual tokens. They're, they are lines of code that establish a virtual embodiment of digital artwork, or any other subject matter that now can be traded through this token uh, sold uh, on a marketplace using blockchain. In my book, I lay out a new theory to explain this transformation in ownership. 
called capital T tokenism, not to be uh, confused with the common usage of little t tokenism for negative hiring practices that we should criticize, but capital T tokenism, which effectuates this radical change in ownership. We can own things through virtual tokens stored on blockchain. And that is the key innovation that uh, NFTs provided to digital artwork. Now, is this a threat as the media have portrayed it uh, initially? Uh, no, this is not a threat. And hopefully uh, people who've joined this uh, meeting or book talk uh, understand that. What this is and what it provided in a really short few years is a, an entirely new market for art, especially for digital art. There wasn't a market for digital art in the past because digital artwork is stored in a copy, a digital copy that can be infinitely reproduced. So if you sell one copy, you cannot retain value in that copy because there's no original, so to speak, like a painting. Instead, there are potentially thousands or millions of copies of the same artwork and whoever buys the digital copy that's sold by the artist cannot distinguish that copy from every copy that somebody made from looking at the artist's website. And of course, artists need to display their works to be discovered and to sell their works. So it was a catch-22 situation for digital artists. What NFTs did was to establish a unique uh, property, this virtual property, in uh, the token, NFT or virtual token. Uh, now I will give you an example of how one artist used NFTs to uh, basically go into uh, full time as being an artist. In my book, I cover uh, a number of other examples of life-changing uh, discoveries through NFTs by artists. But really, this is a global phenomenon. And there are artists around the world who have suddenly found a source of income to sustain themselves as artists. Uh, and I'll describe a little bit of why I think that is significant for our society. Now, let's go back to March 2020. Do you remember where you were? Do you remember where you were? My guess is yes, you remember where you were and what was happening in March 2020. It was the sort of first wave of COVID in the United States. And in New York City, which was the epicenter of the first wave, there was uh, Laura L., who was not even an artist or a full-time artist. She was doing a lot of odd jobs, but her passion was art. And uh, she had been discouraged by her family, friends, colleagues, that you shouldn't pursue becoming an artist because it's too hard to make a living. Now, that practical advice probably has a lot of wisdom to it, given the situation for independent artists that I'll describe a little bit later in my talk. So she listened to that negativity and was discouraged from becoming an independent artist and did all these other odd jobs, including waitressing. But when COVID struck and New York City went into lockdown, she posted this on her Instagram page. Social media is flooded with negativity. Everybody is in a panic mode. I wanted to somehow positively impact people. We are in this together. I'm giving away my custom pet illustrations. You want it, you got it, I'll be waiting. Of course, we can't forget the emoji, heart symbol. Now, Laura L did not have a huge following on Instagram, but this post went viral around the world so that people, pet owners from around the world took her up on this generous offer. And over the next three weeks, she sketched over 1,200 pet sketches, 60 a day, waking up at 5 a.m. and working until the evening to share her works with those to provide this bright moment in the dark days of COVID. And some of the people who reached out to her were healthcare workers working on the front lines in the hospitals. And they told her, they thanked her 
for you know giving this brief moment of joy with her her now in the process she was able to raise twelve thousand dollars in donations for local animal shelters during this lockdown period but more importantly for her this was the spark of creativity that launched her career as an independent artist. Because during lockdown, she decided to devote full time to becoming an artist. And to be honest, in talking with other artists, the lockdown period turned out to be a pivotal moment that gave people more time basically on their hands. And for artists, what do you do? Well, I guess artists create. So there was an explosion of creativity among independent artists during the lockdown period. And Laura L was one of those artists. What she decided to do was devote herself to becoming an artist. And eventually after learning about NFTs on social media, which was the most common way that artists discovered NFTs. Uh, there's a very vibrant community of artists on social media, especially Twitter and Instagram. She decided that she would experiment and try to launch her own collection of NFTs. Uh, and she did so by 2022. She launched a what she characterizes as a storytelling collection focused around the lurkers, which are dark forces in the world represented by this darker character. And by the end of this story, the lurkers will see the good in the world and the color in the world through children and pets. So there is a happy ending to her story. Now, how well did this lurkers collection do? Well, sold over $200,000 in sales. Now, mind you, this is from an artist who was selling pet sketches on Etsy for $10 or less. She even confided in me that she was being nickeled and dimed by people who wanted a discount from $10. And within a year, in the NFT market where the collectors and investors respect artists, she was able to have great success on her first collection. Uh, it became one of the most successful collections on a marketplace called Exchange Art at the time. And just in March of this year, Sotheby's invited her to sell one of her NFTs as a part of its uh, auctions, and it sold for over $10,000. And this all happened within a year or so. Now, if Laura L's story of success with NFTs were the only story I had to tell you to you today, I think it would be very inspirational, a great story, a kind of the Justin Bieber of YouTube uh, scenario, but it's not the only story. That's the great part about this innovation. There are many artists around the world who have suddenly found potential in being full-time artists by entering or creating NFTs and selling them on decentralized marketplaces. There are many artists around the world doing this. So NFTs have been life-changing. That's a chapter or a part in the book uh, that uh, I have discussing the lives of artists uh, who have been affected positively by NFTs. NFTs have changed the narrative from the romantic figure of the starving artist which dates all the way back to Puccini and La Boheme. And unfortunately, that figure has been romanticized. We expect artists to starve to create their art. We can change that narrative to a thriving artist, where artists don't have to starve to be successful as artists. And in two or three years that we've witnessed this explosion in digital art through NFTs, I think we can already tell that this provides a better system than the status quo, especially the one in the United States. The art world is governed by gatekeepers, the museums, the galleries, and the auction houses. Now, in a world that is ruled by gatekeepers, who is left out? 
who is left out? I'm sure all of you have a suspicion who might be left out. We don't have to guess, thankfully, because there are excellent studies, empirical studies, that tell us who has been left out. The leading study for our auctions, looking at over a million auctions from 2000 to 2017, this is the Bocart and his colleagues study, showed or found less than 4% of those works sold at auction during this period were by women artists, less than 4%. What about museums? The study by Chupaz and others at Williams College looked at the 18 major US museums and found similarly, 85% of the works in the permanent collections of the museums were by white artists, predominantly men. Now, even beyond these sobering figures, the business model of galleries and gallery, you know, ga representation by galleries is often considered to be making it as an artist, right? I, I am now an established artist because a gallery represents me. But the business model does not favor artists because the galleries typically take 50% of each sale of their artworks. So just imagine for all of you in this meeting, if the law firm or your employer took 50% of your income, I mean, there's no way you would be able to survive, right? And that's what the situation the artists were facing under the status quo. What NFTs have shown in two to three years is that we don't need the galleries because we can sell art through NFTs, through decentralized marketplaces, and essentially remove or eliminate, bypass the gatekeepers. And that's just to make sure everybody's still awake. Um, under this approach with this decentralized marketplace, the artists keep 100% of the sales revenue minus a modest fee that goes to the, the marketplace, let's say 2.5%. Some marketplaces are 0%, they collect nothing. In addition, here's the kicker. The artists can choose as a part of their sales agreement, their contract, to elect to receive what, what are called resale royalties under copyright law, but more commonly in the NFT world, creator royalties. So every downstream sale of their artwork can receive, uh, the median figure is 5% of the sales. This concept is not new. It's draw de suite in the French. Under their copyright law, they recognize such a right for visual artists. 80 countries around the world also recognize it. The United States has not, despite the U.S. Copyright Office in 2013 endorsing or recommending that Congress should consider uh, adopting this same approach that France has adopted. But for whatever reason, that has never materialized uh, in Congress. Now, what we've seen in one year is that artists have been able to earn over $1.5 billion in creator royalties from sales of their works. That's just one year. Now, it was the boom year of 2021, but we understand that this concept can work, right? Because artists get something to sustain themselves during, like currently, the economic downturn. The economic downturn, they can, by collecting royalty, resale royalties, help to weather the bad economic conditions. So let's take a listen to some of the prominent artists in the NFT market who endorse the idea of resale royalties. Tyler Hobbs is one of the top artists, uh, recently had a solo exhibition by Pace Gallery, uh, creator of the Fidenza artwork series. He said this, it's one of the single largest positive shifts that NFTs have opened up for artists. 
it just makes a difference in the lives of artists and how much opportunity an artist has to support themselves, right? Support themselves. This is for long-term sustainability. Clara Silver, a prominent AI artist, and AI is all the rage right now, said this, probably the single most impactful change is generational transformation and it's fair. Pelosius, another one of the top artists, uh, hand wrote this and then posted it on Twitter. Royalties were the reason the art community flocked to NFTs in the first place. A new democratization, no more gatekeepers, a new doc democratization of art in a new world where artists finally found a way to get paid from their works on an ongoing basis. Sustainability for artists. So what the past two or three years have shown us is that we, if we invest in artists, they can find a way to produce more art, not just in the visual arts. There are platforms for independent musicians that finance themselves through the sale of NFTs. Similarly, for independent filmmakers like Julie Pacino, Miguel Faust financed their independent films through the sale of NFTs. What this shows is that we all can become 21st century patrons, hearkening back to the days of the Italian Renaissance, but democratizing it, expanding it out to uh, regular uh, the lay people, uh, you don't have to be a ruler to be a patron. Now, you may ask yourself, why would we do this? Why, why would we do this today? I've already mentioned the economic downturn, the bad times we face today before in, in this talk. And we have so many problems we, we can be worried about. Why are we focusing art on artists and improving their sustainability when there are so many other problems? Well, I think the reason is simple and it's a practical reason. It is that if we invest in artists, we are investing not just in artists, but we are investing in society and we are investing in ourselves. Because the studies show there are so many benefits to exposure to art. There are hundreds of studies. Uh, and there's another book out that's called Your Brain on Art that summarizes some of the leading studies that show this. Now, what are the positive benefits of exposure to art? The first one alone, I think, would be reason enough to seriously consider investing more in artists, and that is mental health. There have been many studies that show that exposure to art improves wellness and mental health including in therapy. And in, in our days of the pandemic or post-pandemic, when anxiety has increased, having more exposure to art to have the wellness benefits would be something that we should prioritize, uh, given the effects that it could help to reduce anxiety. But in addition to mental health and wellness, there are other studies that show other benefits of exposure to art, including toleration for other people, compassion for other people, civic mindedness. I, I didn't mention there's another study that shows improved test scores among school children. So there are so many other benefits. And in our days of polarization, especially political polarization, having these virtues of greater toleration and compassion for each other, I think that would be something that we should value uh, and place a greater priority on through investment in arts. Now, I've summarized some of these studies, but this is something that I think we all know, especially for those of us we are here because the Center for Art Law, we appreciate the arts. We understand what the arts can do, but we know this generally. So there's a study of Americans in 2019. It found the following uh, results, 90% of those surveyed said art broadens the mind. 91% said that art is vital to education, including future jobs preparation. And 90% said art reduces stress. So this is something we all know. We are exposed to art. It's the reason why we go to the museum, why we listen to music, live concerts, 
uh, go and watch movies. We need art as a part of our daily life. Now, the great thing about NFTs as computer programs, they can be used for unlimited purposes. And one of the other major use that I want to highlight today is that they've been used by businesses to try to rethink the relationship between business and consumer. So NFTs are not just for artists, businesses are adopting NFTs too in this creator economy to reimagine the relationship and potentially collaborate with what we considered in the 20th century to be just consumers. Those consumers can become co-creators of content that is disseminated initially by the businesses. And this is something that I characterize, for those of you who are lawyers, uh, this is something I characterize as decentralized intellectual property. Uh, this is a way to use technology and licenses to make arrangements or private ordering uh, related to this intellectual property in the form of whatever the subject matter is uh, that is being uh, disseminated by the artist or by the business. So I will give you a couple examples of how this operates. Uh, as reimagining the relationship between business and consumer. Startup companies that are using NFTs are now granting commercial rights to those who buy the NFTs, meaning they can monetize the artwork associated with the NFTs, something I characterize as decentralized collaboration. Uh, to understand this, we just need to take an example from the 20th century. Disney is the epitome of the successful corporation of the 20th century. Uh, the Disney studio took its artworks, characters, monetized it, but in a very centralized manner. Disney alone chose who could monetize Mickey Mouse in negotiated licenses by the studio. Uh, and to the extent that there were unauthorized uses, you know, Disney is known for policing its intellectual property very strictly. By contrast, in the so-called Web3 world, the innovative startups, the top one right now is Yuga Labs, has granted through licenses attached to its NFTs the right of any buyer of their NFT to commercialize the underlying artwork. So just to give you one example of this, Snoop Dogg owns an NFT from Yuga Labs, bought it as a on a decentralized marketplace, and decided to use the artwork as the figure for a new business uh, selling ice cream, Dr. Bombay, uh, Sweet Expectations. So that's just one example. There have been numerous, I think there are uh, hundreds of different examples of monetization using this commercial license by others, and somebody has collected uh, an ongoing list of them uh, and has, keeps on updating it on Twitter. Another way in which businesses are reimagining the relationship between themselves and consumers is to envision more engagement, interaction. And I think this is a byproduct of social media. You know, businesses want engagement with their goodwill, the brand. Uh, how do you get engagement? Well, the NFT is a facilitator of the engagement. So that Starbucks, for instance, in its loyalty program uh, called Odyssey can reward the owners of the NFT with different experiences and with different artworks as one example. Uh, and they just had an NFT sale recently with artworks for its first store that did very well. What about uh, fashion or uh, sneakers and apparel? The two industries that probably have adopted NFTs the most are athletic wear and the fashion industry. Nike acquired one of the hot startups called Artifact and the, what they're doing now with the NFTs is that if you own the NFT, you get rights to a digital sneaker, for example, and also a physical pair of Nikes sneakers. Uh, that's, that combination is called digital. 
physical and digital copies. And they're also doing ongoing uh, events for the owners of their NFTs, engagement, interactive ownership. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are following this yesterday, LeBron James uh, just sported one of Artifact's uh, new sneaker lines uh, before the game uh, against Golden State. So like this is how the businesses are imagining, reimagining the relationship with consumers. And then uh, third and finally, in terms of like the businesses, they, the businesses have taken a more permissive attitude to unauthorized uses of their artwork or IP, where it's not considered piracy, it's considered promotion or creativity. So just to use one example, the Mona Lisa's of the NFT collections is called the CryptoPunks. The, the highest uh, sale for a CryptoPunk was $23 million. Yeah, the NFT for this, $23 million. It's a lot. Um, they are probably the uh, you know top NFT collection uh, to date. But that has spawned a lot of copycats and derivatives and remixed versions. The copyright owner to the CryptoPunks has not stopped any of this. Uh, it would be as if Walt Disney did nothing to the copycats of Mickey Mouse, right? That, that would never happen with the 20th century business model, but that's what's happening today with this 21st century business model. Uh, there are over 200 derivative versions that are unlicensed and unauthorized, but the owner of the copyright, Yuga Labs, has not done anything to stop it. Uh, this is all allowed. Now, I want to close soon with two more other tidbits from history to wrap up this talk and then field your questions. And the first is a lesson from the Italian Renaissance. So even though Cubism toppled the perspective of art from the Italian Renaissance, the single linear perspective, there is another lesson we can learn from this period. Uh, it's one that is encapsulated by the late art historian, Professor Bruce Cole, who in his book stated the following, art was not a luxury, but something that society wanted, needed, and used. Consequently, there had to be enough artists to satisfy the considerable demand. What if we do the same and stop devaluing artists as starving artists whose median salary for independent artists is $30,000 or less a year. And during the pandemic that dipped below the poverty level, $17,000 a year. What if we started valuing artists? What would our world look like? It would look like we've already have a glimpse of it I think in the past two or three years, something that we can characterize as a virtual renaissance, where we value artists, they produce this explosion of creativity, society benefits, we benefit. That's how the system should be working. Now, this may seem like a radical idea, like I've gone out and tried to propose something really radical, but I think it's not radical at all. It is something that we would be living up to the ideals of our framers of the Constitution, who in their infinite wisdom have a copyright clause in it that tells Congress what the purpose of copyright is. It is to promote progress. And the Supreme Court has been quite clear how we promote progress in this system. We do so in an economic way, a utilitarian way where we encourage individual effort by personal gain, financial gain. And that's the best way to advance public welfare for society through the talents of authors. And here is the key line, this principle, how we do this. The sacrificial days devoted to such creative activities deserve rewards commensurate with the services rendered. Reward artists for the services they are rendering to society. But $30,000 a year, I believe, is a complete failure of that principle. But you can help change this. 
And I think we've already seen the change starting with the past two to three years. Now, how can you help? The simplest way requires nothing, practically nothing. It is to go on to social media. If you use social media, especially Twitter and Instagram, as I said, those are the main platforms. The artists, especially digital artists, are promoting their works. All you really need to do to contribute to this virtual renaissance is liking some artist's work whose works that you actually like. So here's Laura L's Twitter. You see, you could like it here. And that actually makes a big difference because in the world of algorithms, we know that popularity breeds more popularity in the sense that the algorithm will feed out a post that has more engagement. So Laura L's post, nearly 20,000 views because there was more engagement with it. So that's all really you or anybody else needs to do to become a 21st century patron. Now, I was told by Atreya that there are some of you who probably will be our lawyers on in this book talk. So I wanna to speak to you more directly with the final few minutes and share with you a couple of examples of lawyers who were pivotal to the birth of modern art in the United States. So the contributions of just one or two lawyers could make a world of difference. Arthur Aldis was a lawyer who was on the board of trustees of the Art Institute of Chicago. He almost single-handedly got the Art Institute to agree to host the first exhibition of modern art by a major institu art institution in the United States. And he took a risk in doing so because this show was called The Armory Show and in New York City, it had already started receiving backlash. So as we saw with the students' protest, it got even more backlash in Chicago. So he took a risk in doing this, but that was a key moment for the birth of modern art in the United States because it was the first major art institution to host an exhibition. Then there was John Quinn, and maybe some of you are familiar with John Quinn. He probably had the greatest influence on modern art in the United States in the early period. He was the one, he was a finance lawyer in New York, but he also had a fascination with art and literature. He was the one who wrote an op-ed in response to the anonymous pamphlet that attacked modern art. He refuted it in the op-ed published in the New York Times. He also was the one who amassed a vast collection, actually the largest collection of modern art in the United States at the time. Now that wasn't so difficult because no one was buying modern art in the United States, not even Picasso's works. Picasso's works were shown, nobody bought them. But he saw in them what he characterized to be a radium, an energy, some disruption about this art that no longer was present, he believed, in classical art. So he was a patron to these modern artists in a way that probably not many of us can replicate, but he took his wall wallet and he backed up his belief in this new kind of art. And then finally, he lobbied Congress to repeal a tariff on the importation of modern art that only applied to modern art and not to classical art. It was a penalty against modern artists. So he did a lot to help secure a market for modern art in the United States. And he is looked back onto as a key figure in the development of modern art, especially in the United States. Now, to close out, on a final note, I know we live in fragmented times and it seems like our problems are, in, are vast and insurmountable. You just have to read the paper or watch uh, talk shows on cable TV to think that way. But I'm here to tell you after doing the research for this book and thinking about the 20th century and thinking about the 21st century, really no challenge is too big unless we think it is. If we let that view guide our action. And I believe that the past challenges in the 20th century were way harder than anything we face today. We have the internet 
We now have AI. We have so much knowledge at our fingertips on our smartphone that didn't exist before. Just to give you an example of this, in May 30th, on May 30th, 1899, there was somebody in Ohio, uh, relatively obscure figure, and I'm from Ohio, so I love this example. He wrote this Smithsonian, this handwritten letter. And in it, he said, I believe that simple flight at least is possible to man and that ex the experiments and investigations of a large number of independent workers will result in the accumulation of information and knowledge and skill, which will finally lead to accomplished flight. Now, mind you, humans have been trying to develop what's called a human flying machine for centuries. Leonardo da Vinci, Greek mythology, nobody succeeded. Here's a guy in Ohio who says, we will succeed. I believe we will. But not only that, he goes on to say, I wish to avail myself of all that is already known and add my might to help on the future workers who will attain final success. So who was this guy from Ohio? In the letter, he describes himself as an enthusiast, but not a crank or a crazy person. He's just an enthusiast. He had no knowledge of aviation, that's why he wrote the Smithsonian. They had no internet, right? He wrote the Smithsonian, send me the state of the art. I will study it and I will help everybody else develop this flying machine. That's what his confidence was. Well, it turned out this person was a, the bicycle store owner with his brother, Orville, uh, named Wilbur Wright. And in four years, the brothers developed the first successful flying machine that flew at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And the rest is history, right? And what was the key to the, the Wright brothers' invention? Well, it was technology, a specific technology called a three-axis control system that provided a human the ability to maintain equilibrium in the air by having controls on three planes, the roll, pitch, and yaw, for those of you who are into aviation. And this innovation from the early 1900 underlies modern aviation to this very day, right? And these are two bicycle store owners figuring this out. Now, if the Wright brothers figured that out without the internet, without AI, with just the state of the art provided to them by Smithsonian, I think that we can figure out at the very least a better way to make artists thrive. A system that does not devalue them, but values them in ways worthy of the Italian Renaissance and even better. We can build a better society if we support the arts. And really the only limit that we have is our imagination. Thank you. And, and here is the uh, book jacket cover I was trying to show you uh, earlier. Let me. Uh... Thank you so much, Edward. What a fascinating, what a fascinating presentation. And I think the, the historical perspective, the examples of the artists, what we can do as patrons, a lawyer's perspective, what lawyers can do better. I think all of this is so, so appreciated. And um, mm -hmm. I know I probably speak for a lot of people in the audience who will be reading your book, hopefully by this weekend. <laughs> so thank you so much once again. And I won't take up too much time because I know we have a ton of questions that have come in. So um, let, me, let me ask these to you and hopefully we can cover them all. But thank you once again, Edward. This was really, really wonderful. So one of the questions that we have, a bit of a comment and then a question, part of the gatekeeping function of galleries is to filter to show a more curated selection of artworks. When you see NFTs, there are such a wide range of artworks that range from mere collectibles to more seriously engaged art. Have you seen galleries that have embraced NFTs and work with digital artists to bring this to a gallery setting? Yes, and I think we, we've we only scratched the surface of that. Uh, as I mentioned, Pace Gallery is one of the top 
uh, galleries and they have a solo exhibition for Tyler Hobbs, but they also have shown other NFT artists works as well. Uh, and uh, there are galleries in Europe, uh, I imagine galleries in other parts of the world as well, that have also uh, embraced uh, NFTs. And this, I'll try to be brief because I know there are a bunch of questions. This is part of a larger transformation of art that I believe we are witnessing a explosion of digital and AI art now. So to stay relevant, the galleries and the museums are considering, and some have already adopted or incorporated uh, digital artworks. And the ownership of digital artworks is typically now through NFTs. So I, I think we've only scratched the surface of this because the museums and the galleries know that uh, the numbers, uh, especially to the museums, have not returned to the, the same number of visitors uh, pre-pandemic. And uh, this definitely, I think, uh, is a burgeoning new uh, area as well as market uh, that has potentially the potential to attract probably, you know, at least a, a, diff, a, a expanded audience, right? Uh, some of the people who are into um, the digital and AI art uh, might trend from the uh, millennial and uh, Generation Z um, groups. Thank you so much. We have another question that builds on the previous one. Do you think that like the work of Matisse and Picasso were art historicized and have become cultural heritage that will create an art historical canon for NFT art? There is also a second half of this question. Some places like the Digital Museum of Art in Milan, they seem to already be doing this, but what role do you think that the decentralized IP framework will have in that art historical cultural appreciation over time? So for the first question, was it about the use of NFTs for Matisse and Picasso? Yes, yeah, so that was about um, whether it can create some kind of a canon for creating NFTs, I believe. Okay. You know, I, I think, um, hopefully I, I understand the question correctly. I think it gets tricky for using NFTs to existing artworks. Uh, if our major concern is authenticity, uh, you can add an NFT that goes with, let's say a Picasso from 1911, uh, and say like, okay, well, here is the certificate of authenticity that comes along with the traditional painting. Yes, I think that that use can be used. Um, it's just not um, as foolproof as if it would be with the digital artwork, uh, because the digital artwork, you can trace back the file uh, that's associated in the actual smart contract. Um, now, there is technology being developed where you would incorporate, I, I think, potentially on the um, frame of a physical painting, some technology that is recognized by an NFT, and that can sort of further solidify the collection, uh, connection between the physical and uh, the smart contract or NFT. Um, so hopefully I understood the question correctly that NFT, yes, the art world is considering the use and actually doing this as well, uh, the use of NFTs on existing physical paintings or artworks to provide the certificate of authenticity. And as we know, or many of us probably know, uh, fake art is a problem. You know, how do you establish that somebody owns the real, whatever the artwork is? And there, there's a whole uh, line of experts who authenticate those works. Uh, so um, that's the um, how potentially the NFT could be used as a part of that process. 
Yeah. And just a clarification, she meant it in terms of cultural appreciation. Um, but I think that is sufficiently answered. Thank you so much. Um, another question that we have, what are, if any, the key challenges NFT artists and the NFT market need to overcome at this point to achieve further impact, longevity, and acceptance? Well, I think there are, are two um, big challenges at, at the moment. Um, the, the first is just the macroeconomic conditions. I, I've mentioned the bad economy uh, now several times. Uh, that affects the art market, that affects the NFT market. So that that is something that the art market is not immune from. So it, it is a time when I think um, a lot of uh, people in general are tightening up their pocketbooks, so to speak, right, and not making investments that they might be might have done in 2021. Um, the second big uh, challenge for uh, artists who are considering NFTs right now, uh, and this is, I think, related to the bad economy and, and the bad NFT market, is that there is um, somewhat of a flux with marketplaces that some of which have not respected the creator royalties that I touted earlier. Now, some marketplaces do, but so far there's been an easy way for prior NFTs to avoid having to pay those creator royalties. And how that plays out after after the economy starts getting better and the market starts returning, I think it's uncertain, you know, which marketplaces uh, will respect creator royalties and uh, whether those marketplaces devise technological means to help avoid the circumvention of the payment of royalties. That, that's still a big question mark. Thank you so much. Um, another question, and I know we're running a little over time. Is it okay if we keep you for a few more minutes? Oh, sure. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I'm happy to. Thank you so much. And just let everyone know if somebody does have to leave, we are recording the session, including the question answers portion. So that will be sent. Um, how have you seen NFT artists exhibit or imagine their work in physical spaces? Is it common for NFT buyers to exhibit their work on screens? And are there more ambitious ways of displaying the work beyond just existing only on a computer? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, the majority of displays of digital artworks ha have been through screens. And this, this technology for screens uh, and displaying works, uh, I think is incredible. Uh, and, you know, I'm fascinated by it. I've considered <laughs> purchasing some of these screens, uh, which where you could display uh, your NFTs. Uh, and I think it's only going to get better and better. Um, that is definitely um, something for those of you who don't even buy NFTs. I, I imagine your TV screen, the screen that you have to watch TV is already, you know, pretty uh, advanced compared to let's say five years ago so like the state of the art will get um, better and better um, more recently I, I have seen some discussion about offering physical copies of artworks along with the digital um, I'm not sure um, you know how much demand there is for that um, uh, does, does a digital artwork need to be, um, does it need to come with a physical artwork? Um, I'm just not sure um, whether that is something that there is great demand for. Um, you know, so far it's been predominantly, you know, you have a digital artwork through an NFT uh, and people seem to be satisfied with that. The other thing I, I would mention, uh, and this relates to the gallery issue, uh, Beeple, the artist Beeple, uh, who who sold an NFT for $69 million, uh, digital artwork, he has opened up his own studio 
in, I believe it's uh, South Carolina. And it could be an example of a future uh, institution instead of, or in addition to galleries where artists now organize a uh, studio gallery. And uh, I thought of this because if you look at any of video from his studio, like the screens are wall to wall. I mean, it's just, it's just massive. Uh, so I, I think that's the kind of thing that uh, we are going to see more of in this virtual renaissance. Thank you. And other question and a comment, NFTs were supposed to guarantee authenticity. Do you have any comment on the rampant fraud and trade and illicit NFTs? Even famous board apes have been stolen. Yeah, I think though that involves uh, two different issues. For the kind of outright fraud where it, it is a fake uh, NFT of some other, let's say a crypto pump, it's a fake one. The marketplaces have done a pretty good job in detecting like outright fraud uh, with a ver various mechanisms, including th the verification symbol. Like uh, OpenSea will verify this is the source of CryptoPunks. That's one example. Uh, so I, I think the outright fraud uh, with a fake NFT collection has been largely, you know, dealt with. The second part of the comment or question, you know, is a serious problem stolen NFTs? Because that uh, it is related to commonly um, phishing emails. Uh, so you click on a link that you think means one thing, but it really means you're exposing your wallet, crypto wallet, and opening it up to the fraudulent stealer who um, absconds with your NFTs. Um, there are safety precautions that owners can take to minimize that from happening, like storing your NFTs in a cold wallet uh, offline, uh, like a ledger. Um, but um, even I think sophisticated investors have had their NFTs stolen. And um, it, it's probably one of the biggest problems for NFTs because you don't you don't want your million dollar NFT, you know, stolen. And it's so hard to hard to get back. Um, so you know, it it is it, the, the law is somewhat uncertain on um uh who owns a stolen NFT afterwards. All right. Thank you so much. And I think our final question for today, as digital art and NFTs become more and more prevalent, how can we ensure that intellectual property rights are protected and respected in the Web3 ecosystem? Yeah, I think that is something up to uh, each artist or business to figure out what level of IP enforcement do I want to adopt? And also, what rights do I grant my NFT owners? Uh, so it could be kind of the more uh, permissive approach and granting commercial rights, or it could be more like the Disney approach. I'm not going to grant any rights um, except for non-commercial uses. Uh, and then I, I think, you know, that is something that... Um, it faces just the same situation as exists in the world outside of NFTs uh, to enforce copyright or enforce trademarks uh, always requires, you know, some labor and expense by the uh, owner of the IP rights, uh, whether it's a business or an artist. Um, so, you know, it's not seamless and it's not costless. Uh, but uh, I would just maybe put in a little bit of a pitch for the consideration of these more 
permissive approaches that have been adopted by others already, whether it's the granting of commercial rights to the NFT owners, or maybe taking a little bit more permissive approach in terms of derivative works created from uh, you know, one's artwork, um, or imagining it in terms of maybe it could be projects that invite um, members of the public to engage in some collaboration project. Uh, some businesses have already done that, like Adidas and um, uh, Prada had a joint project. They hired an artist and tried to create a collaborative work. Uh, and this, I think, relates to the comment that I made earlier. Uh, businesses are trying to reimagine the relationship with consumers. So it's not just all about consumption. And this is just being developed. But um, I think it's a it's an exciting period. It's an exciting period to think that um, it doesn't have to be all only about mass consumerism. It could, about, it could be about collaboration, creativity, right? We can unleash the creativity of those who support us as patrons. Anyway, those are my two cents on uh, that issue. Thank you so, so much, Edward. I think the, the last answer you gave is, it, it's so relevant and so exciting, especially in terms of NFTs with AI, fair use, copyright, the lawsuits that are coming up. So I feel like there is a lot that we can help with. There are a lot of areas of ethical collaboration and um, it's this presentation has just been wonderful. And I know there are a couple of people who have your book and are ready to read it um, over the week, but this has been so, so helpful. And we really appreciate you taking the time out and taking the additional time out to stay back and answer the many, many questions that came in. So thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Atreya. I mean, I enjoyed it so much. And thanks to everyone for your excellent questions and participation today. Uh, it's really wonderful. Thank you. And um, I have sent across a survey in the chat box. It'd be wonderful if you could um, fill that out and let us know what you'd like to hear next from the center. Um, and thank you once again for staying a little longer. A recording along with the materials will be sent across. And uh, we really appreciate all of your questions, your comments, and the links that were sent during the during the presentation. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, Edward. Bye-bye. Thank you.